Gospel of the Lord. The sliver of text we just heard from Revelation on this All Saints Day is a kind of graceful interlude in the Bible's ultimate cosmic drama, which, along with the Beatitudes, may be just what the doctor ordered on this first day of November in the year 2020. Most of us have a passing familiarity with the book of Revelation, most often translated through horror films or pop culture paperbacks, or maybe classic literature or classic rock. Fewer of us have actually read this strange and haunting book in its entirety. Revelation tends to be associated with doomsday Christian cults like the Branch Davidians, or so-called premillennialists awaiting the rapture. Episcopalians prefer to keep our distance from things like that. Even though Revelation language is woven through our most beautiful liturgies, we don't often read it or preach it on Sundays. So my little splash of words this morning can hardly do this book justice, but let me try to set the scene. In heaven, God is seated in jewel-encrusted splendor on a throne, before which are seven flaming torches, the spirits of God, and something like a crystal sea. Thunder rumbles, lightning flashes, and four bizarre creatures covered with wings and all these millions of eyeballs girdle the throne, showering God with glory and honor and thanksgiving. Encircling them, all dressed in white, are 24 elders on 24 thrones, and the elders take their golden crowns off their heads and throw them down before God as they sing these loud hymns of worship and praise. In God's right hand, there's a scroll with writing on the outside and, and on the inside, on the front and on the back. And the scroll is God's definitive plan, the end game for all creation, and it is fastened shut with seven seals. No one in heaven or on earth is deemed worthy enough to open it until at last one is seen standing among them. And the elders know it must be the lion, the anointed king of the house of David, but no, it is a lamb standing as if slaughtered. The elders fall before the lamb, holding these bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The lamb takes the scroll from the right hand of God and one by one breaks each seal. One, two, three, four, five, six. If the seventh seal is broken, the scroll will open to initiate the final and violent transformation of heaven and earth. And so before that happens, 144,000 souls, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, are quickly marked by an angel with the seal of God on their foreheads to protect them from the wrath to come. And this is exactly where our reading this morning begins, between the sixth and the seventh seal. It is a moment of extraordinary suspense and trepidation. Corruption and greed are crushing the vulnerable. Death and destruction lurk at the gate. The empire rules with an iron fist, and the day of reckoning has arrived. And you know, some modern Christians love this text. They can't wait for the seventh seal to open, because for them, this is the good news because they are so confident of their own righteousness and, and certain of their place among the exclusive set of the saved, and they're eager for the day of reckoning, because they will be raptured, and everyone else will be left behind. But other Christians approach this reading more cautiously, holding fast to the promise that the revelation to John is given not to punish an already outcast and suffering people, but to comfort them. 
for us. Good news is what happens here between the sixth and the seventh seal in this little interlude before the final devastation because it's here that we are given a glimpse of another world, another way. And this is how John describes it. After this, meaning after the sixth seal is broken, after this I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. In other words, beyond and including those numbered and sealed by God, there is now a vast, varied throng of humankind in every shape and size and stripe. They approach the throne, praising and blessing God. And what do all the angels do when they see this great crowd? They fall on their faces with joy. And then in a verse that always strikes me as sort of funny, one of the fancy elders with the golden crowns turns to John and says, who are all these people robed in white? Where are they from? As if to say, this is a much larger crowd than we expected. Did we invite all these people? But immediately, the elder answers his own question. Obviously, they are God's as well. Witness the radical, thrilling inclusiveness of God. Witness all the saints, signed, sealed, and delivered. Which sounds like a perfect way to end this story, kind of like a fairy tale. But of course, remember, this is not an ending at all. It is a suspension. It is a pause in the relentless drive to the finale in order to prepare God's people and to protect them, not by spiriting them away somewhere, but by marking them, sealing them as vessels of this mysterious grace that even now is breaking open the present to reveal God's future kingdom. And that is a much more biblical definition of saint than the notion of some kind of Christian superhero. So today we remember that just as material wax seal on a scroll serves two functions, one to authenticate whatever's written inside and to protect whatever's written inside from those who shouldn't have access to it, we too are sealed in baptism as these vessels of the Spirit. First, we're made in the active holy image of God. We're these three-dimensional reflections of God's nature to create and forgive and love. And then we are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. We are sanctified, not because of our own perfection, but because God is working in us through Jesus. So, in these next days, as the chaotic swirl and the stress of the world around us builds and presses in, we are given this All Saints interlude to hear again God's promise to be with us in whatever ordeal lies ahead while also reminding us that there are real consequences and expectations for lives that bear the Jesus seal. Because seals are made to be broken, right? They're not just for decoration. They have a practical purpose, like the seal in a jar of jam. That seal ensures that, that the contents have been properly and safely prepared, but unless that seal is broken, no one will ever taste that sweet fruit, that reason for being. And the seal we bear forms us, protects us, marks us as part of Christ's ragtag family, blessed in our brokenness, saints of God. And when this seal of our lives is cracked open, when we're willing to deepen our own hurt for love of God and love of neighbor, when we pour out pride and indifference so that we might be filled with humility and a hunger for justice, then we live into this sacred interlude and the promise of revelation. Standing with the multitude before the throne and before the lamb, between the sixth and seventh seal, Exhausted, exhilarated, hopeful, free. <laughs>